begin. Uh, let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a terrific guest who has written an astonishing book, a really, really powerful book, one that I think everybody in higher education needs to consider. The book that we're talking about, called The Fantasy Economy, is an extraordinary book. And it starts with a premise that I'm going to try to recapitulate here. And Professor Krauss will tell me if I've gotten it wrong. The idea is that starting in the 1970s, the American economy started becoming more and more unequal. Wages and overall compensation began to plateau. And an idea came forth. The idea was that the responsibility for this economy was education. That if education, K through 12, and higher education and grad schools, if only they did a better job, people would have more human capital and would get ahead in the economy. They'd be able to meet the economy's needs. Everyone would be able to make more money and the things would be just much better. And Professor Krauss is telling, this has been a huge driver behind all kinds of education reform from within higher education and K through 12, from school boards, but especially from corporations, nonprofits, and think tanks. And he calls this the fantasy economy because it doesn't describe what's really going on in the economy. And he says that it's had pernicious influence on higher education and how we think about that reform. It's a fascinating and powerful charge that should make you rethink a lot of what we know about higher ed. So before I say anything more about it, let me bring the author up on stage. Greetings, Professor Krauss. Hi, Brian. Very good to see you. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, a pleasure. Where have we found you today? Is this your office? Uh, yeah, this is my office at uh, University of Wisconsin, River Falls. Yeah. Excellent. Well, if, if you're in Wisconsin right now, I have to ask the question, which is, how's the weather there right now? Um, well, we didn't really have winter this year. Uh, what? <laughs> not much of one. So it's like, I think it's like 50 degrees here. We're um, very close to Minneapolis, St. Paul. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, at least, you know, in this part of the state, very, very little snow. Uh, and quite a bit warmer than usual. So, wow, 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 that's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. It sure is. Well, before before I start herring off after climate change, let me stay on topic and say sure. we, we have a tradition of asking people to introduce themselves by asking them to describe what they're working on next. What does the next year hold for you? So, I mean, what projects, what ideas are top of your agenda? Well, you know, I'm spending a lot of time um, working to try to kind of preserve the University of Wisconsin system as we know it. Um, mm. uh, I'm president of the United Falcons, which is our, our local uh, union here at UW River Falls. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have collective bargaining um, because we're precluded by law from collective bargaining in Wisconsin and higher ed. But uh, we do have a dedicated uh, state AFT um, branch and, and we have um, we have. Uh, locals on pretty much all the comprehensive campuses across the system and right now we're we're working very hard to try to essentially maintain the university of wisconsin system that is such a great system of public higher education but is uh, increasingly under threat uh, so a lot of my my efforts uh revolve around that and, and the book of course is is what got me into this whole discussion about not only k-12 but higher education so it's really given me a foundation to to um to kind of better understand a lot of what's going on and a lot of the forces that are really trying to transform higher ed uh, for the worse, in my view. Mm -hmm. Well, we're living in Wisconsin, teaching in Wisconsin for the past 20 years. That's quite a context for this work. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we, we do have, uh, we, we've gone through, I should say, a number of changes and, uh, um, you know, in the last 10 to 15 years, um, uh, state funding has just been reduced in Wisconsin and all the states um, very yeah. you know gradually to the point where a very small percentage of our our budget um, yeah. on campus comes from the state and so we're tuition driven like yeah. uh, like most schools are um, and so uh, the, the the forces of austerity are really kind of bearing down on us and this is happening of course at a time when the state of Wisconsin and many other states are are enjoying record surpluses uh, which you know, uh, makes no sense, right? I mean, it's not like there's some sort of shared sacrifice or something. To the contrary, the yeah. state of Wisconsin, uh, you know, we saw the, the what happened at West Virginia here, uh, West Virginia University recently. I mean, West Virginia is another state that has a significant budget surplus. North Carolina, I read about some things that were happening in North Carolina. This stuff's happening all over the country. So, um, you know, we're, we're just trying to work very hard to kind of maintain uh, what what really uh, has been built over a period of uh, over 100 years in Wisconsin and, 
and really really must be maintained i think if we want to if we want to uh, uh you know be true to the wisconsin idea and, and, and the role of education in, in maintaining democracy as well in the as you say that in the chat our good friend and american historian phil katz just put in whatever happened to the grand wisconsin idea well that's a great question uh it it, it ostensibly still exists um but uh you know we're being squeezed so much uh on campus that uh it, it's it's almost hard to find it in, in many public discussions you know all, all we hear about is is uh belt tightening and more efficiencies and we need to maximize the number of students and and uh you know uh with the assumption being that we're, we can't be a public institution again a truly public institution again and you know i and, and many others reject that categorically I and mean, this is a political choice that's been imposed on us and and really public systems in 49 other states uh, that that could be otherwise and um you know, privatization and austerity does not benefit students. It does not benefit the public. It certainly does not benefit democracy. And um, you know, that's what uh, what AFT Wisconsin and and uh, I think uh, unions actually across the country are standing up forcefully for public higher ed. Well, as 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 we should. Um, and if uh, folks, if you're new to the forum, we've had uh, some sessions on academic labor over the years. Uh, including a couple on union organization. So you can just take a look at the archive and, and grab some more. Um, Professor Krauss, I, I have to say your, your, your book is so fascinating. It's so cleanly organized, clearly argued, uh, meticulously sourced. I mean, your, your dissection of different pools of data about the labor market and about uh, academic outcomes, I, I think is, is essential. Um, and uh, I'm really glad to see you, you know, getting us to pay more attention to the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, which is so solid and so important. But I, I, I want to start by asking a couple of, of general questions of, about this argument. Um, I, I think you heard my, my intro where I, I was I was trying to trying to recap the argument as far as I can understand it. And I, I think a, a key part of this is this is this shift for education reform to think about education, all of education, right, K through gray, as they say, right, mm -hmm. uh, as primarily about economic de economic development, um, mm -hmm. and that this is kind of the uh, education's failures are why wage and compensation growth has stagnated for a generation, and only if only we could fix education, then then that could be better for the for the labor market. I, right. Am I doing a good job paraphrasing so far, or am I missing? Um, yeah, more or less. I think that's that's a fair characterization of, of what I call uh, the fantasy economy. And and uh, I know John Shelton was on your show uh, last year. What, you know, John refers to as the education myth that that, mm -hmm. that, that the education system can somehow uh, magically overcome, um, you know, inequality, wage stagnation and so forth. Yeah, I think that's a fair, fair description. Well, it goes back in part to what both you and John, as well as Tressie Cottom cite. Uh, I'm blanking on the author right now. I want to say it's Grubb who came up with the idea of the uh, education gospel. Yeah, Grubb and Lazarson. Yep, yep. Yeah. The, the faith book. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. You, you go to education and it transforms your world and it makes everything better. And if you do that, we don't need to worry about anything else. We don't need to worry about union membership. We don't need to worry about the minimum wage. We don't need to worry about labor laws or uh, taxation or anything else. That that education is the gleaming grail that will solve everything, that will heal the land. Um, well, I, I was going to ask another question, but actually, before I could even get to there, one of the participants asked the question I was going to put to you. So let me let me let him do it because it's much better that way. This is from uh, our good friend uh, in Florida, Glenn McGee, and he asks, "What's your opinion of human capital theory?" So Glenn hasn't um, read the book, and I have, so I know yeah. what you're going to say, but I want you to cut loose. No, that's a that's a, a great question. I, I deal with it in the book, uh, not in extensive detail, but it is an important part of the story. Uh, John Shelton's book actually deals with it in much more detail, uh, the education myth. Human capital theory um, has origins in the 1950s. Uh, some economists basically um, you know, formulated this theory that really tied um, income to individuals education and formal education and skills and as early as the 1950s human capital theory was used to explain uh inequality was it was used to explain more or less differences in in wage rates um people that you know got more education um would 
receive higher incomes and people who had typically lesser education would receive lower incomes. Um, you know, in, in some respects, uh, human capital theory uh, is, you know, it has merit. Um, but there are so many flaws in human capital theory. Um, you know, we can't, and this is really a, a, one of the major points of, uh, of the book. I mean, we can't create more jobs for people with college degrees or master's degrees or whatever by cranking out more people with college degrees or master's degrees. That's not how the economy works. That's not how the, how the labor market works. Yeah. So the idea that, that, that if everybody gets a degree, a two-year, four-year, whatever, uh, and then goes out into the labor market, I mean, the reason I call the book The Fantasy Economy is because the real economy is still dominated by predominantly low education, low wage, low income jobs, largely non-unionized jobs. Yeah. Um, and, and so what we have in the United States today is the best educated population in history uh, competing for what is still predominantly a, a low education, low skill, low wage labor market, which results necessarily in large, you know, high levels of underemployment. Uh, but then there's also a lot of people that work, you know, in jobs that require their degrees that are paid uh, relatively low. Um, and they're, you know, they got the same education they would have gotten 30 and 40 and 50 years ago. But if you are a teacher, if you're a civil servant today, to give two examples, um, and public sector wages have been held down over a period of of decades, essentially, then jobs that used to be essentially middle class jobs are no longer middle class jobs, right? We see this uh, throughout, you know, government employment and the, and the education sector in particular, many nonprofit jobs too. So human capital theory, I mean, if it would be great if it were if it were actually true, <laughs> if if your education always, you know, if you got the right education, that it always led, you know, uh, guaranteed essentially. Yeah. Uh, uh, higher income. Right. Um, but there are so many flaws that it, it, empirically it, it's and, and yet it serves. I mean, we have to remember the context that some of the, the economists that were pushing human capital theory mm -hmm. were basically opposed to the New Deal. Yeah. Uh, were basically opposed to the social welfare state. This is not simply an abstract, you know, uh, theory that's created outside of history. Uh, it's created, you know, by a number of uh, economists, some of whom are at least hostile to, you know, government policy. And, and so the idea to put it all on the education system, uh, my book focuses, you know, largely on the Reagan administration to the present, but I mean, really that, that emphasis has been around long before the Reagan administration and dates, you know, at least to the 1950s or so. Well, the, one of the things that I admire about your book is that you you trace the the influences behind these arguments, where you you keep a steady eye on uh, corporate funding and on foundations and on associations, and you identify their own biases and and their own interests, which I think is is very striking. Uh, I mean, I think readers won't be surprised to see the Gates Foundation come in for criticism, but there's 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 quite a bit more. Um, uh, Glenn, thank you for that perfect question, uh, and and Neil, thank you for the for the excellent answer. Uh, in the in the chat, uh, we've had all kinds of comments, and I'm going to share them with you afterwards, uh, Neil, because okay. this is great. Um, there's a, another question that comes up from uh, our friend who might be in Scotland today. I'm not sure. Donald is from Scotland, but he's a, a traveling guy, uh, and he asks a question that kind of reverses uh, the terms of the uh, of the argument a little bit. Didn't higher education create neoliberalism? Was it the cause, not the victim? It has its origins in Hayek, the economist, but it was U.S. academia who formulated it through Chicago, Milton Friedman, and business schools. Um, that okay, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, so, individual scholars, the field of economics, um, certainly did uh, play a big role in actually formulating this thing called neoliberalism, right? Um, there's no question about that. I don't deal too much with that in the book. I deal with mainly the politics of it. And um, and what I argue is that, um, that, you know, in the 70s and 80s, well, 70s neoliberalism is still kind of, um, hasn't been sort of fully adopted yet, really, until the, the election of Reagan. And that's kind of what really is a watershed moment in modern history, mm. where, where the government is is seen as as the enemy and free markets will save us um 
And what I argue in the book, and this is through basically an analysis of funded research. I mean, the Reagan administration was 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 very um, well organized in terms of, of funding research. They funded research at Teachers College, Columbia uh, University, uh, in an operation called the Institute on Education and the Economy, which is a, plays a major role in the book. And they also funded the Hudson Institute study, Workforce 2000. Um, so they, they fund, and they funded research at, by the way, a number of other major universities. But the theme of all this research was, you know, the workforce is, is, is really inadequate because the school system is failing and we need to revamp and, and restructure the entire school system. And the argument is always because all these high skill, high education jobs are right on the horizon. They're, they're before long, and this is in the 1980s, before long, you're going to need a college degree just to do anything. Is, this is conventional wisdom. I mean, I grew up in the 1980s. I remember these arguments, you know, these were like on the front page, literally on the front page of the, of the New York Times. Um, and that, you know, that was mostly Reagan money and, and business money that was behind those claims. And this is when the skills gap is born and, and all the rest of it. And, and what I argue in the book is that really the neoliberalism agenda is, is so incredibly unpopular that, you know, it, it's, it's a major assault on unions. It's, it's, a, it's basically uh, deregulating everything and, and lowering corporate taxes and offshoring of jobs and the loss of industry and all this stuff. You can't go to Ohio or or, you know, Michigan or Wisconsin or any place in 1984 and give a speech and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. Vote for us. That's yeah. not going to work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is basically say, hey, there's a huge skills gap. There's all the, we're in the, in the information age that becomes the knowledge economy and the schools have to be fixed because pretty soon our students are going to need a college degree just to, to do any job. Um, there, there's the knowledge economy never came. There, that's the economy now. I argue in the book is not just looking at the labor market. It's not a knowledge economy. It's a predominantly low education, low skill, low wage economy in which really a minority of jobs require uh, college degrees, and certainly a very small minority require advanced degrees. Um, you know, so I think the origins. Back to the question: the origins of neoliberalism certainly are in the academy. There, there's no question, right? But then. But then basically the, the, the corporate, you know, corporate interests in the Reagan administration kind of get together and say, you know, let's just change the debate. Let's not talk about the loss of industry and, and going after unions, whole, you know, wholesale and all the rest of it. Let's talk about the schools as being the only, only, only source of economic opportunity. And that's really um, to the present day. That, that's really how we think about education right up to the present day. And um, so yeah, the the origins of neoliberalism are are many, and it does have philosophical underpinnings in the academy. I, I would agree with that. Well, thank you, but thank you for the great answer, um, a very very thoughtful answer. And Neil, excuse me, Donald, thank you for the excellent question. Uh, he adds in the chat, um, um, good point about the uh, real economy not being the economy. Higher education thought it would be AI will accelerate this. We can we can come back to that point. Um, but just a, a quick kind of station identification moment here. Um, sure. This is this is the time for all of you to put forth your questions and, and your comments. Uh, so if you really have if you have a question you want to put to us that you want me to put to uh, Professor Krauss, just hit the Q and A box again. It's the bottom of the screen, white strip question mark. Or if your camera is on and you want to join us, uh, you can tell from visual evidence that you do not have to have the beard to be on stage on the forum. Um, so just, just hit the raise hand button. We'd be glad to beam you up on stage. Um, also, if you haven't had a chance to read this book, uh, on the bottom left of the screen, you should see a kind of tan colored box. That's just the fantasy economy. Click on that. That'll take you to the book's page. Um, Chris Aldrich does a great job of sharing uh, a book on on the topic you just mentioned, Neil, um, which I don't know. It's by uh, Orestes, Naomi, and Conway, The Big Myth, How American Business Talks to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market. Oh, so okay, okay. That's, that's there in, in, in the chat. We also had a, a, an observation from uh, my namesake in Michigan, Brian Deo. And I was going to read this from the, from the chat. He says, after decades of privatization, austerity, the gutting of liberal education in public universities, extreme vocationalization, onlineification, the student debt crisis, the neoliberal university is looking more like a site of labor discipline these days. 
do do you want to respond to that or uh wow there's a lot there i mean i i uh, certainly agree i mean it, it that's the situation again going back to what we face in wisconsin and what many public systems face across the country um what i find is that austerity is kind of the vehicle by which you bring about these major policy changes because you don't want to have a debate on the merits about whether or not we ought to have you know liberal arts majors across wisconsin or across the country what you do uh, is you squeeze public higher ed to the point where certain programs are dropped uh, and others, you know, STEM primarily business are, are propped up, even though the number of STEM jobs is actually quite small. It's been small for decades. Yeah. It's not projected to grow very much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, and, and, and it really is. I mean, I think the, la the, the last uh, phrase the, the questioner used, a, a labor discipline, I mean, a huge percentage somewhere in the neighborhood of half of as you know brian as of all people who teach in higher ed are are part-time our adjuncts are, are you know teach one two three courses whatever are not on the tenure track right have no job security have no um uh you know have, have no in this day and age you often don't have a, a job guaranteed the next semester right it's semester by semester at many institutions i mean i was talking to uh, uh, a class recently, I said, imagine if you, you went to, you know, your doctor's office, uh, and half of the MDs in the building, uh, were paid very low, had, had jobs at multiple hospitals, right? Uh, maybe at multiple doctor's offices and they were actually quite, quite good. And they were different ages. Some were 30, some were 65. I mean, they were all different ages. They were, but you couldn't tell as the patient, right? I mean, we wouldn't stand for that. We wouldn't stand for that, but in higher education, uh, not only do we stand for it, we're often told, well, that's just how things are now. Um, I mean, that's how austerity is pitched, right? It's not promoted. It's not sold because it can't be. So it's just basically, well, sorry, public institutions are just so yesterday, right? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, I thought that was a great quote. And the more I think about it, I could talk about it for a whole hour. But I know we have some other, other questions coming up. Well, we, we have a bunch of questions. And uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, Brian. Thank you for that question. Again, folks, the Q&A box is there for you. Just press that button. Um, or if you want to join us on stage. Um, none of my cats have yet made an appearance, which is shocking. Um, but but they, they may still, which may lure you all on under the stage. Um, we have uh, a question from uh, a friend who couldn't be here today. Uh, and he addressed a particular point, um, which was, uh, let's see. If, uh, this is from uh, our good friend, Kiel, who says that in your blog at uh, Academe, um, uh, now I'm reading from him. You seem to yeah. come out against colleges issuing credentials, and he quotes you um, saying, colleges and universities can't change the labor market by giving people as many possible degrees, including credentials, micro-credentials, stackable credentials. So yeah. then he asks, do you share his view that colleges should be relieved of their responsibility for credentialing and more job training shifted to employers? Um. Yes, generally uh, speaking, and that's one thing I don't deal with in the book is job training. But yeah, I, I absolutely think that job training should should uh, should go to employers. I mean, it used to be, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, a fairly significant part of, of many, you know, many corporations, many business models would be, you know, job training would be something that would businesses would do. Um, the, the You know, the whole notion about credentials and stackable credentials and all this terminology i mean when you look at the jobs that actually exist right um there are very very few that require formally you know typically require some kind of credential that's not let's say a high school degree or a two-year degree or you know or a four-year degree or whatever right so the market for this is essentially just just um non-existent really as i see it i mean you have these firms selling all this stuff to higher ed which is because higher ed is portrayed as permanently in crisis so we we start you know like creating these credentials um but then when you look at the jobs in the world and, and the the certain the requirements that are typically um you know needed for different kinds of jobs you don't see that that stuff out there you know you, you know there are some you know jobs that do require certificates uh it's a pretty small percentage of jobs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks this as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, in general, I think, you know, the questioner, you know, is correct that, yeah, most job training, a lot of job training should be done by employers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, 
Kiel, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. This is Neil Kiel. Huh, your names are almost identical. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> This is this is a focus of Kiel, and he's he's done great great research on on this subject. Uh, thank you, thank you for that answer. We have uh, another comment uh, that came in um, from um, let's see, well oh, the chat box is on fire now. This is great. We've got a, a quick question for the chat box. Um, if uh, uh, if I anonymize the chat box and lightly edit it, do you mind if I post the contents to my blog? Just quickly let me know. Usually people are fine with that, but let me know if you want me to. Uh, uh, to skip something. Uh, here's another uh, a question which addresses one aspect of your argument in, in the fantasy economy. It's from Karen Belnier, who says, as someone who is now working in professional learning, continuing ed, the skills gap doesn't seem to resonate with the business people I talk to. The business people I talk to are much more concerned with behavioral choices and skills. I'm wondering if, if you could speak to that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think of a couple things. One, the the early um, research, early in the in the story I tell, um, the National Center for Education and the Economy did a study, their their first study, um, which was actually cited by the Sandia report, which was suppressed by mm -hmm. the George H. W. Mm -hmm. Bush administration. Um, found yeah. that that uh, a very very small percentage of employers actually. We're concerned about uh, employees having not having sufficient skills, but some other some other employers talked about personal habits and, and things like you know timeliness or, or what have you. Um, and, and so that 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 strain I think has been there for a long period of time. And there is a difference between um, you know, and I didn't look at this in detail, but I read enough reports to at least comment on it. There is a difference between what individual CEOs would say and their trade groups, their interest groups would say, right? Um, um, the interest yeah. groups, I mean, the Chamber yeah. of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, there's never not going to be a skills gap. There can't not be a skills gap. It's a political position. Unemployment could be, you know, 20 percent and the Chamber of Commerce would you know, breathlessly say we can't find enough skilled workers. But mm. then if you went to managers or, 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 you know, individual CEOs or bosses, you would probably get a different story. Some would say that, but others might say something different, but they're not, they're just speaking for themselves. And the, the, the interest groups are the ones driving policy. So um, that concern about it's like employee habits, that's, that's actually been around a long time. Yeah. Which is, it's, it's distinct from the, you know, skills that, that we would, I think associate, you know, writing, speaking, organizational skills, certain, you know, uh, language skills or those kinds of things. Oh, thank you. That That's that's a terrific answer. Um, uh, thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, we have more questions pouring in. Uh, we have a question from a, a good friend who just stepped out. So I want to make sure he gets this in the recording. This is from Kendall Bryant, who asks, quote, do you have any analysis on how all of this relates to systemic racism, unquote. That's a, that's an excellent question. Um, one of the major uh, themes of the book is that really since since the modern education reform movement, which is basically the 1980s, um, education reform, first in K-12 and now in higher ed, uh, is really pitched large to the academy and to educators it is pitched largely in terms of being able to over, overcome uh, racial inequality, racism, you know, systemic racism, history of, of uh, you know, histories of, of legacy of, of slavery and of segregation and so forth. I mean, if you read education reformers today in higher ed, they taught that, you know, this is the Gates Foundation you mentioned uh, earlier, Brian. I mean, they're they're framing their whole argument largely in terms of racial inequality um, and systemic racism. But the point I, I make is that, you know, you can't overcome systemic racism. We can't educate our way out of that. We can't educate educate our way out of poverty, you know, um, because no matter you know, no matter how many and I'm a, a you know, I'm a, a strong supporter in in absolutely sending everybody to, to higher ed who wants to go to higher ed. I would make public higher education free, absolutely. There's no question. But if we, if we say we're gonna alleviate poverty and you know, uh, blacks and Hispanics are disproportionately affected by poverty by sending everyone 
uh, uh, first by fixed by you know changing K twelve schools, uh, and then by sending you know all low income students on for two year degree, four year degree. Mm -hmm. That's not going to do it. That can't do it because that that won't change the jobs that exist. That won't bring people's wages up, right? Um, so I mean, I think it's it's if we're going to you know focus on education to address systemic racism, it's it's not it's not going to work. It can't work. Just like it can't address this you know structural poverty. I mean, poverty is about the amount of money that you earn, right? It's about the wages that you make and your standard of living, and and we can change the education system any which way. We can have all the debates and we can make a million more, you know, charter schools and all the rest of it. That's not going to change the fact that down the street, a warehouse went up and there's 2000 jobs. And by the way, Amazon is going to fight to the death to make sure that those jobs aren't unionized. And, you know, we just fixed the schools and that's that's the economy. That's the economy. So, yeah, systemic racism is a, is a huge problem. But, you know, to get at it, through of course it is to get at it through the education system is it it, it, it can't work it can't work it, it's 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 more complicated than that for sure okay well kendall thank you for the question i, I hope you're hearing this in the recording i really appreciate it and and thank you neil for that for that reply uh we have two questions that respond to this so i want to i want to give them or respond to what you're just saying before that as well so i want to make sure we get them in now and what is there's another follow-up from glenn mcgee who uh, uh pushes back um and says so no nine million jobs vacant and I, i'm guessing Neil, you're going to say they're nine million very low skill no higher education required jobs that 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 could be glenn that could be the case if, you, if i had some time i would look it up there's like about 164 million jobs i think in the united states um so at any one time there are several million job openings um because people quit they retire they die they change jobs so i mean there are at any one time several million vacant jobs for sure um but that number again is it's how many jobs are there according to the bls it's, it's over 160 million i forget the exact number so so the vacancy rate, um, that's that's one of these numbers that's, you know, invoked quite frequently, um, you know, uh, but there's always a lot of vacant jobs. Oh, by the way, that's not a lot relative 9 million, assuming that's correct, out of 162 or 4 million, something like that. Yeah, and it's about, what, about half as many jobs as there are people in the U.S., roughly? Uh, yeah, about that, because there's a lot, about 330 some million, yeah, yeah, 335 or so million, yeah. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Well, as, as usual, Glenn, thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, that's a that's a fun one to chew on. But we also had a response that came from Elaine uh, at the uh, University of Albany, SUNY, uh, who is a library strategist, which means I just I just love her automatically. Um, and uh, and she says here in New York State, two colleges, Casanova and College of St. Rose are closing and many state schools are carrying significant debt. Can you elaborate on austerity being an artifice if this is happening? So uh, Albany is, is special for me because I went to SUNY Albany, so I, I certainly know that city well in the university. But, um, you know, the, 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 there's different things going on, private schools versus public schools. Um, and I, you know, most of my analysis is on public schools because over 70 percent of, of students do attend public, uh, public institutions. Um, so why private schools might be consolidating or closing uh, in some cases, it, it's not an unrelated question, but it's different, right? Because they haven't relied on state funding the way public institutions have. I mean, I think what, what's happened is over the decades, um, you know, states, you know, all states really, it, it's happened everywhere. It's it just to, it's a matter of degree, have scaled back the public contribution to public higher ed, right? So, you know, now states are being told to address, and this is a coordinated effort, by the way. This is this very clearly seems to me to be a coordinated effort uh, across multiple states right now um, to make public universities address deficits, which many of them have had for many, many years, but all of a sudden just became pressing when so many states have budget surpluses. But when you when you contribute less, over a period of decades, just, you know, austerity happens, you know, one year at a time. Inequality happens one year at a time. So when you create over a period of decades, basically tuition driven institutions, which is what we have, um, 
then then institutions are all you know sweating every minute of the year looking at the numbers how many do we have coming in how many do we have coming in oh wait the numbers are down you know and then you ask a question well are the numbers always supposed to go up i mean you know um and a lot of people don't necessarily have an answer right for that but we've created this situation it's kind of a perfect storm where states have scaled back their contribution and we are tuition driven primarily right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if the numbers do go down which the numbers for many institutions have go gone down from a basically an all-time high from 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, a lot of things are on the chopping block that, that that didn't used to be on the chopping block. And then you get programs that don't have, don't have real strong defenders among, you know, in, in the business community or in the foundation community. Uh, and before you know it, I mean, they're just, they're, they're just going to be, be eliminated. I mean, I have a whole chapter in the book on the politics of No Child Left Behind and how we got to standardized tests in the United States. And, you know, one of the things I discovered in the pages of Education Week in the early 90s was that reformers knew how unpopular, they were very well aware of how unpopular standardized tests were. And so, you know, led basically by the Business Roundtable and, and Pew, they really kind of drove this effort, um, created a, a very public campaign that ultimately culminated in No Child Left Behind, which, by the way, wouldn't necessarily have even passed were it not for 9-11, yeah. which really changed the politics, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? Because it, it was in conference committee on 9-11, and it wasn't a foregone conclusion it was going to pass. But once standardized tests were imposed, that's how education is now, right? Even though they've done nothing for educational, you know, in terms of mitigating poverty and, and lessening, inequality has grown since no child left behind right wages yeah. have stagnated for you know yeah. 60 to 80 percent of the population right that's my real fear about how austerity right now which by the way is a political choice during a time of prosperity is going to be used to fundamentally remake higher education as we speak i mean just read the higher ed, higher ed press every single day there are more stories around the country and it, the stories are always the same they're always, well, there's a deficit. And then you look the state up and, oh, wait, they've got, I mean, North Carolina has like a $33 billion surplus or something crazy, right? And yet public universities in North Carolina are fighting for their lives right now, right? Um, uh, and once, you know, I mean, Congress tomorrow could pass a law and repeal No Child Left Behind. It's just a law. It's not a legal question or a constitutional question. Um, but that would require, that would require a lot of, whole lot of effort. And I'm not, I don't underestimate the, the effort that that would take. Um, but once, once a, a public system has changed, once we, we have English majors only available at the flagship and at private schools, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. That's it. And, 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 you know, higher education itself, higher education administrators, leaders, I mean, they, they all accept austerity like it's God given, like it's gravity, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, you know, it's just how it is now, you know, just how it's just, you got to get realistic. You know, I hear that term a lot too. Um, well, we see where things are headed and it's, it's, uh, and in some places they're already, they're already there now. Right. And, you know, I think it's time for education to stand up for education. Right. Uh, because austerity, particularly again, during a time of prosperity in most states is indefensible, is indefensible, particularly for all those interests and all those groups who are invoking, you know, a shortage of skilled workers and a knowledge economy and all this kind of stuff. I mean, which is it? <laughs> which is it, right? So, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. Neil, do you, uh, do you use Twitter at all? I do not, no. no. I'll, just, I'll just put this in the chat. Um, there is a, uh, um, a colleague who is at the University of California system uh, he is uh, attending a California Assembly Budget Subcommittee hearing on higher education finance. Uh, and he's, he, he's live tweeting the discussion. And the first comment he says is, um, it is the beginning of what legislature, legislators believe will be years of discussion around austerity budgeting, austerity budgeting right away. Uh, I just I just put that in the chat um, right now. No, that's um, great. Thank you. Well, we have we have 15 or 14 minutes left, so maybe we can take you know, we can spin from what you just said uh, and start talking about some of the directions that we could go in in, in terms of uh, what we can do 
um, we have a, uh, uh, a great, typically deep question from uh, our dear friend Tom Hames, uh, coming to us from Texas, who asks, well, how do we decouple education from being a dysfunctional employee pipeline into being a citizen creator? That's a great question. Um, I think for starters, what we need in the United States is a very different discussion of economic opportunity because we can't, we can't talk about education differently until we first talk about economic opportunity differently. Um, because once we talk about it, economic opportunity much more broadly and say, you know, um, you know, collective bargaining is important. The social welfare state is important. We have to look at the culture of business, right? Which again is, is you know, you're mentioning books. I mean, I, I was just looking on my shelf this morning, this book, uh, The Man Who Broke Capitalism by, by uh, David Gels about um about jack welch i mean it, oh. it, there's all kinds of books written by um non-fiction authors about a hey, capitalism in the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s was quite different right employees were seen as an asset and then they became a cost right um so i think i i think that that, that back to the question um, I think it'd be very difficult to, to, to redefine or reframe the purpose of education, which, by the way, I think is absolutely essential, and I advocate that, it, until we first talk differently and reframe the whole discussion about economic opportunity. Um, and and we, we, we say, we assert, and we, we affirm that, that all work has dignity, um, that the minimum wage has to come up with inflation, um, and the, you know, a whole series of other policies. And I talk about them a little bit towards the end of the book. Antitrust has to be taken seriously again. Um, and large corporations have to be broken up because that's, that's making stuff cheaper for us, but it's also making the cost of labor cheaper as well. Um, I think once we start, I mean, you, these two things can happen simultaneously, but I think that, that if we start trying to discuss education and the purposes of education differently, in the absence of a larger discussion about the, how you know, economic opportunity works, education is just going to get killed because 18 year olds come to college and they say they've grown up in a society that says, this is like, you know, this is my ticket. So okay. this is my ticket to, and, and, and so that's all they know, right? Those, you know, people our age know most of the age of most of us, we know something different, uh, at least, you know, somewhat different. And so I think, I think the discussion of economic opportunity has to has to take place as well in order for us to talk differently about education. Okay, well that's a, that's a key point, and and you 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 sound maybe I'm maybe I'm reading too much into this, you know, but you 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 sound like uh, the call that our good friend Chris Newfield has, um, yeah, you know, yeah. For, for rethinking public higher education as a public good, and that should be part of a larger uh, social transformation. Absolutely. Uh, uh, we have um, to if, to expand on that. Um, another friend of ours, uh, the wonderful Giselle Larose, who is hopefully coming to us from uh, New Orleans. Uh, she has she's looking forward to reading your book, but also, can you uh, tell us more what your call to action is at, at the end? So that would be your conclusion, not the epilogue. The epilogue is 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 interesting, um, yeah. but but the conclusion. Can you add more about what we should be doing? I mean, I think that what I said just a moment ago is is the beginning of it. I think we have to rethink essentially the last 40 plus years of the political economy that we all take for granted. Mm -hmm. I think we have to rethink and, you know, and just take a look at how has it worked out for most people when a third of the population used to be in a labor union. And now that number is about 10 percent. Right? Um, it hasn't worked out very well. So we have to we have to, you know, uh, affirm very strongly our commitment to collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to look very, very seriously at antitrust and break up large corporations. We have to raise the minimum wage regularly with inflation. Um, we have to do whatever we can, and and you know the Biden administration is trying at least to do this in some ways, to to you know give employers incentives to 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 build things in the United States and and not give them incentives to leave the United States. Um, you know, we have to do all the, and, and we also have to look very, very closely at the culture of business that we all take for granted, right? A culture that basically says that people at the top and owners and shareholders will be compensated very generously. And then the wages for the, the remaining 97% will be kept down as low, very intentionally, 
as low as as possible. Um, that you know, I mean, what 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 Gels talks about in his book on Jack Welch is you know that's not how large corporations used to exist used to be just a few decades ago. It's not ancient history, right? Um, so I think we need to we need to do all those kinds of things, um, and then I think then I think we can begin to reclaim the many purposes of education uh, in terms of creating citizens. Um, and I don't I don't certainly I don't dispute the fact that I mean if you want to become a teacher if you want to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, you've got to go to you know school you've got to get a four year degree for all those things and then more for other jobs. That's always going to be the case. I mean I, I would never you know suggest otherwise. But this 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 tight linkage between education and economic opportunity that we just we take as as a given we take it for granted. That's what's killing education. That's what's killing education because we can't create jobs, we can't give people raises, we can't do any of those things. We can educate, right? We can educate students to the best of our ability and put them out into the world, and you know, and then that's it. But if we're held responsible for people's livelihoods, which is, this is the paradigm. This is the fantasy economy. Mm -hmm. We're held responsible for your livelihood, right? Uh, so that's why we have austerity when most states have budget surpluses, because mm -hmm. we're so weak. The assumption is, well, look, we're failing, right? We take that as, as a given. Um, I think we can have those kinds of discussions. Again, once we, you know, once we look very seriously at all the things we take for granted, granted, excuse me, in, in real liberalism in terms of policies, business culture, and so forth. There was, uh, uh, well, that's first of all, that's a that's a terrific terrific answer. You're you're giving us a whole set of of, of marching orders, which is which is great, uh, which is uh, what we what we really you know that's what was asked for, and I think that's that's what we need. Um, uh, friends, if you if you would like to put in another question, uh, this is this is your chance. Uh, so hit the Q and A. But I mean, I, every time I say that, it seems like people beat me to it, and they start asking more questions, which is great. Um, uh, John Hollenbeck asks a very specific question, uh, which is a really nice one. It kind of builds on Tom's question here. I'm humbled by the amount of change that is needed. Can existing higher ed systems really reclaim the citizen emphasis? Um, well, I mean, they could, I think they could in a, in a technical sense right now, because of the discussion in high, in education is, is basically so dominated by business. I mean, the language, the assumptions, the data, mm -hmm. um, that unless there's a fundamental shift in, in how education is, 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 is run essentially, then, then no, we, we really can't. Um, because that, it, much of the story I tell, so much of the funded research is directed at education schools. Um, so you have education schools um, or public policy schools, right? Cranking out this research saying the education system is failing and the workforce is always inadequate. These are these this stuff's happening within ed schools and within policy schools, right? Yeah. So um, there has to be a huge shift in how K-12 and, and higher ed are run uh, it, for us to get to that, for us to get to that point. Because otherwise what happens, right? It's, well, of course we should create citizens, but we just, you know, uh, we have to get rid of this major because I don't know, uh, the local business down the street says they can't find enough major or enough employees for this and we have to create a, a major for them. I mean, that, that's basically what's playing out at, in, in towns across the country. <laughs> that's mm. how curriculum decisions are often made. You know, mm. a local business leader will say, well, we just can't find uh, yeah. enough skilled workers. And then before you know it, we're getting rid of departments and we're creating new ones. And, hey, everybody has a right to advocate for their interests. I mean, that, you know, I just think I think education should advocate for the interests of the education system and the public. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if that were to happen, I think we could begin to have that, that larger discussion. Mm, mm, well, thank you. Thank, uh, well, that's, that was a great question, by the way, John. Um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and, uh, we've had a, a, a few more notes. I, I just, as a, I, I guess, well, as a facilitator, I, I had a, a couple of last things to ask. One, one is if you could look ahead, say 10 years. Um, 
And if a given state was to adopt your your ideas, uh, so you know, pick a state, you know, New York, Arkansas, whatever, Wisconsin, right? Uh, they start to rethink the political economy of the past forty years, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, start to change their, they start to take the public uh, sector seriously. Uh, they reduce the price of colleges, uh, and they. What is if if we just imagine that playing out for ten years? What is what does that look like at the end? What what kind of what kind of the higher education world results? Uh, I think that uh, in terms of higher education, it would it would result in more of a of a system that um, was you know was truly comprehensive for for students that. It wouldn't be a higher education system that is increasingly specialized because the labor market is not increasingly specialized. Um, you know, going on your uh, your question, I mean, if if public funding were restored, it would become a lot less expensive, and I think that would open up greater access. Um, and and I think it would obviously have to, you know, it would have to be part of a broader sort of political economy shift uh, in order to get that. You know to to happen but i think it would be um it would be a, a higher education system that wasn't constantly under stress right that, that was viewed as a public good in the same way that the parks and the police department and and other agencies are looked at mm. they're not they're not you know the police department is not crime driven <laughs> right i mean they're they're funded because we need law enforcement right um, yeah. you know, I mean, you wouldn't have to make public higher ed free to get to that point. Yeah. You could simply restore uh, a lot of the public funding and then make it much more accessible and, 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 and much less costly. Um, and yeah. also give students, you know, I mean, we have students, you know, if, if you, and this is again playing out around the country, if you, you know, you were going to go to a school down the road and all of a sudden they got rid of all these liberal arts majors, but you wanted to major in sociology, you wanted to major in history. Uh, what do you do? What do you do, right? 20 years ago, you had that school down the road. 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, now you don't. Um, so it, it really does. It really does make education, make the, the citizenry much better, much much better educated as well. Mm -hmm. So you you'd have that kind of overall uh, leavening of of, of thought. Um, what what a what a great vision. Uh, Neil, we we are at the end of our hour. And we, we have to wrap things up. And I, I'm amazed that this hour just flew by because you, you have this this book is so powerful and uh, your your charge makes us rethink so much. Um, I, I really want to thank you uh, both for the book as well as for spending a, a, a wonderful hour with us. The, what's what's the best way to uh, to keep up with you and your work, both your scholarship, but also your work in the Wisconsin system trying to undo all of this? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, AFT Wisconsin is, is, is pretty active in the public debate uh, mm -hmm. these days. And I, I mentioned John Shelton before. John is, mm -hmm. John is on Twitter for sure. He's extremely active in the public debate. But, um, you know, that as well as John and I tend to write a lot of columns. Um, uh, and I write a lot of columns for the Cap Times, which is a Madison publication, mm -hmm. about sort of what's happening about austerity. Um, so there's always something to talk about there. Uh, do that pretty regularly, and uh, and yeah, and, and any other outlets that I can that I can write for. So um, keep advocating for the for the system. Well, well, that's terrific. We uh, that's great work. Uh, please keep fighting the the fantastic fight, um, and uh, we will uh, we will have to check in with you uh, to see where this goes. And uh, I, I think we we'd love to have you back, Neil. Thanks very much, Brian. I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed the questions and, uh, um, you know, I think it was a great opportunity, a great discussion. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. The forum is a truly special community. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, don't leave yet. Uh, let me just uh, uh, wrap things up for you. First of all, I just want to repeat what I just said. You guys are special. These were fantastic, fantastic questions. Um, and comments uh, throughout the chat. Uh, if you'd like to keep this going on the socials, as they say, uh, please use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, you can hit us at uh, Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, or, or at my blog. 
if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including the one aforementioned with John Shelton or any of our previous ones, touching on anything about the economics and labor of higher education, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash archive. If you want to look ahead to our other topics that we're talking about, go to the forum website, forum.futureeducation.us, and you can see we're talking about everything from new paradigms in higher education, the Department of Education, to leadership from marginalized populations, to education abundance, to educational technology. Thank you all again uh, for participating. It's, it's, a, it's wonderful to think together with all of you. I really appreciate all that, that you've contributed. I uh, hope everyone stays well. Those of you who are in the North Country, I hope you uh, uh, get to enjoy the weird lack of winter and or stay warm. I hope everybody is uh, well. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>